Between 1957's The Adventures of Twizzle and 2005's New Captain Scarlet, Jerry Anderson produced 18 television shows, all of which still enjoy varying degrees of popularity to this day. Along the way, however, he also produced several one-off television projects, some of which made it to screen, and some of which that he decided the world would be better off never seeing. Here is the story of one of those. Even the best laid plans go wrong. The Investigator was shot in Malta in 1973, shortly after production concluded on the second season of The Protectors, and was to be another hybrid of supermarionation and live action. Prepare yourself for a rough ride. Unlike The Secret Service, however, The Investigator would be filmed entirely on location, without the resources of a fully equipped studio to fall back on. The whole thing shouldn't take more than half an hour. This 25-minute pilot episode was devised by the Andersons to show to their friend George Heinemann, then Vice President of Children's Programming at NBC, in the hopes that he might commission a full series. Same as before. As things turned out, however, Heinemann would never see the finished pilot, because everything that could go wrong did go wrong on The Investigator. Well, let's see what our visual scanner tells us. The premise of The Investigator involves a benevolent emissary from an alien planet arriving on Earth hoping to make your world a better place. After encountering two human teenagers named John and Julie, he promptly reduces them to one-third normal size so that they can go and do all the hard work for him while he hangs around in a cave in Malta being mysterious. That, of course is the whole idea. Even more bizarrely, the pilot chooses not to show us any of this and instead opens with John and Julie post-miniaturization waiting for instructions from the investigator. For their very first mission, he assigns them the formidable task of stopping a portly chap in a blue suit from stealing a painting from a church. But how can we stop him? And why us? Because you represent the hope of the future probably safe to say that the investigator's intricate master plan to save humanity is going to take a while. We're so helpless like this. Not if you make use of the special powers I am about to give you. These powers included John's instant and apparently total expertise regarding any piece of technology, plus whatever else the plot needs him to know about. How do you know all this? It's like I always have. And Julie's power of being Julie. Oh, she uses the telephone at one point. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't matter who I am. Malta is, however, a pretty big place for two tiny teens, so John and Julie are going to need some way to get around. And, since stealth is clearly vitally important to their mission, the investigator gives them the noisiest, most conspicuous car in the world and the noisiest, most conspicuous boat in the world. Yeah, that'll do it. John! Let's give it a little tryout. Hold on, Julie! And so John and Julie roar their way to the church, just in time to completely fail to prevent the painting from being stolen. But they get it back in the end, so that's okay. You have both done well on your first mission. Throughout the story, their reduced size doesn't really provide any particular benefit or hindrance to their mission, almost as if it was entirely unnecessary to begin with. Oddly enough, sir, so are we. The puppets that would portray John and Julie were created especially for the investigator, in the same human-like proportions as those first seen in Captain Scarlet. However, unlike those of their predecessors, the eyes of the John and Julie puppets gave the characters a uniquely sinister quality that only further diminished any appeal this pilot might have had. You think he was having a nightmare if he saw us? The voice cast for the investigator would be something of a Thunderbirds mini-reunion. Peter Dindley, the voice of Jeff Tracy, would voice the investigator himself. And now your questions will be answered. While John and Julie would be played by Scott Tracy and Lady Penelope voice artists Shane Rimmer and Sylvia Anderson. Rimmer and Anderson would also collaborate on the script, while her then son-in-law Vic Elms composed the main title theme, and the Protector's composer John Cameron provided the incidental music. So far so good. As for the human performers, the investigator has some. Kind of. Unfortunately, they all seem thoroughly disinterested by the whole affair, and mostly give the impression that they didn't even know the cameras were rolling. It had better be. The villain Stavros Karanti was played by Charles Thake, who had previously appeared as a Maltese police inspector in The Protectors, but who fails to make any kind of impression here thanks to the odd decision to shoot the human actors as far away from the camera as humanly possible, often from behind. You ask for mercy, Karanti. You've shown a little bit throughout your life. We are told that Karanti is a very naughty man, 
But all we actually get to see is that he really, really likes this one painting, he apparently lives on the Contessa di Contini's yacht, and is locked in a constant battle with his henchmen over who can grow the most amazing moustache. It's beautiful! Anderson himself would be taking on two roles on The Investigator, that of producer and director, and often found himself in conflict with himself over how best to show off the Malta locations without going too far over budget. We've got to warn him, John. As a result, he was thoroughly dissatisfied with the final product, and laid much of the blame squarely at his own door, although many of the production's woes were simply the result of bad luck. Bad weather ruined more than one day's shooting, and the radio-controlled investigator car would often receive signals from nearby aircraft that could send it speeding out of control to mow down unsuspecting passers-by. All part of the investigator service. Anderson and his team finally returned to England without having shot all the material they'd planned to, and cobbled together the final product from what they had. The results impressed no one. It will never bring you happiness. Having enjoyed great success selling models based on vehicles from his previous shows, Dinky Toys were so confident that any new Jerry Anderson series would be a smash hit that they commissioned models of the investigator's car and boat before the pilot had even been completed. It's been an hour and still nothing. Once it was clear that the investigator would not actually become a full series, they redesigned the toys into generic military vehicles and released them anyway. As an armoured command car in 1975, and a Coast Guard amphibious missile launch in 1977. Some variants of the packaging still pushed the Anderson connection by giving him credit for the investigator designs, although the original vehicles themselves had actually been designed by Reg Hill. The radio-controlled vehicles used in the episode itself also still survive to this day, and have come up for auction several times over the last few years. John, I had the shot. I thought Karandi had killed you. Sporting new hairdos and new costumes, the John and Julie puppets would also return in 1977 in Alien Attack, a commercial directed by Anderson for Jif dessert toppings. Flying saucers. No! Flying dishes! Faced with an assault of flying desserts, the heroic, if clearly somewhat unstable, agents of intergalactic rescue decide there's only one thing to do. We'll have to eat them! Nobody can eat that much, Semolina! We might, with new Jif dessert toppings. They make desserts delicious. Hey, we've got them licked! <laughs> Jif dessert toppings! Not only delicious, but they could safeguard the future of mankind! The Investigator was never aired on television, although it is now available on DVD. Unfortunately, time has done little to increase its appeal, and it remains one of the most lackluster Anderson productions. Okay, Julie. I think he's had enough. Even if the project hadn't apparently been cursed from the very beginning, it's difficult to see where a full series could have gone. The idea of a disembodied alien intelligence using human agents to make the world a better place had potential, but the script realises it in such a mundane way by boiling it all down to giving one insignificant art thief a mild scare that the sci-fi element almost seems like an afterthought. We've wasted enough time. Its characters are also easily the most uninteresting and unappealing of any Anderson production. Well, except for this goat and this horse. Many Anderson fans wish there could have been more adventures for the Tracy Brothers or the residents of Moonbase Alpha, but there are very few who are clamouring for the return of John, Julie, and the Investigator. <laughs>